Good day. Welcome to the Corey Morgan Show. I am, as the name would imply, Corey Morgan, and uh, we've got a good show lined up for you this week. This is the Western Standards production where we cover some news items, interview interesting guests, interact with commenters and viewers, and uh, get a lot of stuff off our chest. So I, I do want to remind people as well, you know, so I mean, some of the folks are going to be watching the rebroadcast on television, and that's great, and I appreciate it. But uh, yes, uh, when you hear me referencing commenters, you won't see those comments, but I'll try and uh, make it clear when I'm talking to them. And as for you guys commenting, you know, make use of it, chat with each other, send questions my way or towards my guest. I don't necessarily read them all on the air, but I do see them all, guys, and I appreciate it. And just uh, try to keep things fairly civil with each other, though. That's always the important part. We can get upset and mad and get on each other's cases, but we still don't have to get beyond the pale. So I got a, a great guest on today. It's not been too long since she was here last. It's Tamara Leach. She's going to be on in a little while. And the reason we've brought her back is because her book has just come out called Hold the Line. And uh, it's already been quite the, the bestseller, I believe, on Amazon in some categories. And it's really making the rounds. And it's fantastic. So we're going to talk to her about that and see what that's all about as well. I will be talking about news items and opinion and all that good stuff. So I'm going to start with, as usual, my opening monologue. Now, this was from a column about a week ago, so a lot of you Western Standard readers may have already read it, but this one really took off. I, I mean, I, I'm not here to pat myself on the back, just sometimes a column will really resonate with people, and this one seems to have. And I've never gotten so many emails back from readers on one column before, uh, mostly positive, a few telling me to get stuff, that's nothing new. But I mean, obviously, this is something people want to talk about, people want to read about. So I want to reiterate it for those who are viewers and, uh, and, and, and make sure that you understand that, you know, this, this discussion and where we've been coming with things. So it's easy to critique proposed policies of mandatory drug treatment being imposed upon addicts from the comfort of a suburban home. When one hasn't seen this disorder and misery spreading on the streets of every major city in Canada, one can convince oneself that it really isn't that bad out there. A person can delude themselves and think that policies of enablement will eventually lead addicts to liberation from their poison of choice. They can call efforts to intervene in the state of addicts inhumane and refer to it as something like imprisoning Albertans against their will. In fact, that's the exact approach NDP leader Rachel Notley is taking on the issue. And those were her words. Exactly. Now, the UCP under Premier Daniel Smith dared to broach the issue of mandatory drug treatment. And as usual, the partisan subjects have gone wild. Now, what privileged progressives like Notley refuse to understand is that addicts are already imprisoned against their will. They're trapped in a cycle of substance abuse which drives them to seek larger and more frequent doses to the point of an almost inevitable overdose. As they stumble down that path of addiction, they lose their jobs, they lose their homes, they lose contact with their families. They live on the streets in fear, misery, and desperation as it gets harder to find the means to get their drugs and keep them in their stupor which would allow them to forget their life situation. The fate of an addict once they've hit the streets is bleak. Unless they somehow find their way into a recovery program, they're likely going to end up either in jail, in a hospital, or dead. How on earth is it compassionate to say that we should leave addicts in that condition to their own devices? I mean, sure, it's always preferred, of course, to let free will dictate a person's path in life. That's working, though, under the assumption a person is in their right mind. A heavily addicted person living on the streets is not in their right mind. Yes, it's best if an addict voluntarily checks themselves into treatment. Unfortunately, once they're down on the street level, very, very few will do that. For most of them, once they've hit that point, intervention is required. Now, last week, I wrote and I said on this show on how I had a family member we had to deal with, and they, he needed, be, needed to be committed to a mental health facility. It was a tough process. The facilities are limited, and for now, he's still residing there. It's terrible to have to force a loved one into a situation where they're held against their own will. In the condition he's in, though, we know that he can't take care of himself, and he's beyond what we as family members can offer him with home care. We were forced to face the hard reality he needed to be committed for his own sake, and we do hope it's temporary. Now, society needs to make that decision when it comes to addicts. I can assure you, any family who has a loved one living on the streets in the throes of addiction will welcome a forced intervention with the intent of saving them. And I know success rates for addiction treatment aren't the greatest, particularly if the addicts didn't come of their own will to begin with. But still, the success rate's infinitely higher than having no treatment at all. Now, beating addiction is rarely a solitary journey. 
An addict needs support and guidance to stay clean. It's a long-term thing. It took me several false starts and countless support meetings before I finally managed to permanently end my addictive and destructive relationship with alcohol. I never would have been able to do it alone. And I can't imagine how somebody at the point of living in the streets can get started on recovery, much less complete the process on their own. Street addicts can't just up and quit cold turkey. To every person claiming it's inhumane to force drug rehabilitation upon addicts, I invite them to go out and see how it is for themselves then. Get out there. Spend a day riding city transit into the city cores. Walk the alleys into the parks. You'll find numerous addicts in a state of deterioration. Look at them curled up unconscious in bus shelters or behind dumpsters after they get their fix. Watch the ones shouting at the clouds as they shuffle down the street in a drug-induced psychosis. Look at the sores covering their faces and their emaciated bodies as the addiction is eating them alive. Spend a day doing that. I'm serious. Do it. And then come to me and tell me we shouldn't intervene. Tell me how that person on the park bench, stoned out of their wits, soaking in their own feces, must be left alone for the sake of their dignity. There's no dignity in death. And that's the inevitable destination of many street addicts if something doesn't knock them off their path. Intervention and mandatory treatment isn't the perfect option, and it won't work for them all. But it's still a far better course of action than the failed policies of enablement and wishful thinking that's led to the spread of addiction and disorder we're seeing on the streets today. That's the rant I got this week, guys, and it's, it's, it's the truth. And this one just hits me hard. It drives me crazy. Whereas I, I, I honestly think a lot of the people who are saying intervention is wrong or that we can fix them, or they call them, they sugarcoat it. They're not addicted. They're unhoused. Yes, they're unhoused. They're unhoused because they're addicted. we got to get to the core thing if we're going to get them out of the trouble they're in. Most people living in the suburbs don't see it. They don't go into the alleys. They don't see quite how bad it's gotten. And how awful it is. And the emails really got to me. The number of people. It's one of the things nobody likes to talk about. And that's why I want to talk about it. Because we, we, we shuffle it off. You know, you don't talk about that at the water cooler. You don't talk about it in general. But a lot of us have loved ones either have mental health issues or addiction issues. And you know what? We're not going to find solutions until we accept that. I mean, a lot of those emails I got were saying, thank you for bringing this up. I have a, a niece who's on the street. Or I have an uncle who's on the street. Or I have a... a, a cousin who died of an overdose. It's touching everybody everywhere. But still we're seeing these ridiculous push for enablement. This idea that if we could just keep giving enough safe consumption, they'll get better. They won't. And I'm not wholly against safe consumption sites and trying to mitigate harm. There's some truth to it. We can't treat them if they're dead. So if we can stop enough overdoses, hopefully we can get them to the point where we can intervene and save them. But without treatment, it's pointless. All you're doing is dragging out a slow, ugly, and unnecessary death. And it's hurting us all, and the associated crime with it is just nuts. So that's that's what I got going on this week, guys. And uh, yeah, we, 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 have to, we have to address these things. I'm just going to have a quick look through the comments. Good to see you all jumping in there, guys. Uh, and, and John Vancouver bringing up, you know, it's the results of deinstitutionalization. And I talked about that a bit before. It's We've moved away from putting people into institutions. And there was a good reason for it. The institutions were abused. There were terrible things that happened. There were bad conditions. They were underfunded. And I tell you what, the mental health facilities that my uh, family members in, I'm going to be visiting them this afternoon there, aren't the greatest. They're doing what they can with what they have, but it's not a great place to reside. And they used to put, literally in Michener Center and, and Pinoca in Alberta, they had people with cerebral palsy back in there in the 60s and 70s. They had deaf people put in there. They were using them as dumping grounds for undesirables. It was wrong. But instead of fixing the problem, we threw out the solution. And we should have addressed that. We still need these institutions. And they should be a last resort, but it has to be there when that resort is needed. We've got a lot of addiction beds opening up, 8,000 of them in Alberta, as a matter of fact. But Again, getting these people into them, that's another issue altogether, and we need to start talking about it. All right, let me pivot a little, and uh, let's talk about something else. Uh, so, I mean, a big thing in the news, let's get into government waste and spending, one of always another favorite pet subject, uh, depressing in its own right, but not as bad as dealing with addiction. Uh, the, the government's addicted with taking our money and giving it to their buddies. In this case, $13 billion to Volkswagen for a battery facility in Ontario, of course. I'm surprised it wasn't in Quebec. $13 billion. And it's going to be flushed, guys. It's going to be flushed. Volkswagen's going to take the money and run. Oh, they'll build something and eventually it'll fall apart. We'll be on the hook for that too. And there'll be layoffs. We've seen this. We've seen this so many times. And you know, 
Alberta isn't innocent in it. I mean, for those of us gray enough of hair, we remember the MagCan and Novatel, these things that in the in the 80s and, and early 90s, the government was subsidizing all these stupid business ventures. They were going to diversify Alberta's economy away from oil. Doesn't that sound familiar? Well, if you ever drive south of Calgary, there's a great big, when you get towards High River, so about half an hour south of Calgary, you see this giant red brick building just a little bit, a few miles off to the highway to the west. Strange, it's been there forever. That's the MagCan plant. It was a magnesium processing facility. Somebody smelled the idiocy of a government willing to throw out subsidies on notions and economic diversity and modernization and said, we can process magnesium in this spot. All I need is half a billion tax dollars and we can do this. That facility was only open for a few months. And now it's sat there, shuttered, closed. In fact, we're spending, I don't know, there's security guards and a, and a trailer that's permanently there. So we're spending money just to keep it there. I know there's lights on when you get close to it and go by, but there's nothing being done within it. It's too specialized. It's, it's too unusual to be leased out for anything else. Eventually, we'll spend the money to pay to rip it down. That, that building... That dinosaur, that's what we're going to see with the Volkswagen battery plant out in eastern Canada. And also what it does is gives our prime minister, who wants to shut down the energy industry in western Canada, one of his things to point to. See, this is the transition, guys. This is the transition. You can leave the rigs and go work at the battery factory. See, we're not putting anybody out of work. We're transitioning them. No, you aren't. You're creating false industries. If there was a demand, if it was real, if it was possible, if it was feasible... They wouldn't need 13 billion of our dollars to do it. It's not that complicated. Likewise, I'll finish up getting on a local rant. We've got, uh, yes, Premier Smith announcing yesterday with the mayor of Calgary and others that a new arena deal has been struck for Calgary. I mean, they, they need one. Sure, the Saddle Dome is, have, the roof is falling apart. It's out of date. But taxpayers are going to be on the hit, hit, on the hook for hundreds of millions of dollars for this new arena. Let's not pretend... It's because, you know, it's not because of election time coming. Of course it is. And it'll probably work. That's a, You know, we've got to stop being so responsive to being bribed with our own money, and maybe they'll stop doing it. But uh, Daniel Smith desperately needs Calgary support numbers to jump for her. Calgarians have been very concerned that they're going to lose their hockey team. And uh, jumping in and, and pouring 300 million tax dollars into a private venture is what her solution to it has been. And it's just maddening. It's, it's maddening. It's, it's circling the drain. And it's these endless subsidy wars. And, and we get those people saying, oh, but look, this city over here subsidized theirs, and they'll steal our team if we don't do it. Oh, well. Come on, guys. Uh, there's other cities that have built arenas, stadiums, huge ones, without soaking the taxpayers for it. If there's a market for it, it'll be built. But if and I don't even flame, fault the, the, the sports company that own the Flames for taking it. If you can get the money out of them, they're going to push for it. And they know, of course, coming up to an election is a very good time to get their hands on it. But, you know, and I, I get frustrated with that myth that all oh, these arenas, they bring all the money into the city. No, they don't. They redistribute money. Come on. I mean, Calgarians, have, are they going to say, oh, geez, the Flames moved out, which I don't think they ever will. But either way, the Flames moved out. I was going to spend money going down to the games, but now I'll just take the money and roll it up in a joint and smoke it. No, they're going to spend it on something else. They'll go to a restaurant. They'll go to a football game. They'll go to a movie. They'll, they'll take a vacation. The money doesn't disappear. The arena doesn't generate money. It takes money. It redistributes money. Sure, there's people employed in the arena and in, in, in restaurants and bars in the area and parking, but let's not pretend that it's generating something. I mean, it benefits people. Sure, there's adds some value to the city and adds to some identity and things. But we can have those things without subsidizing them. That's the point. We don't need to get into the business of sports arenas. But it's too late. We're not getting out of that one. But we got to start speaking up. Because, you know, and again, I've been supportive of Premier Smith. I, I'm really fearful of an NDP government. But boy, how much conservatism is going to be left in her by the time she gets there if she keeps... Going down this course, she was very opposed to arena subsidies only a few years ago. All right, that's enough out of me. Let's get some ranting and raving out of somebody else. We've got our guest on deck. As I said, we got Tamara Leach here to talk to us this week as she's got her new book out, Hold the Line, and let's bring Tamara in and talk about it. Hey, how's it going out there? It's going great, Corey. How are you? Great rant this morning. Oh, thanks. You know, well, I've always got lots of rage and fury that I have to vent forth to everybody else or, or I'll be yelling on the sea trains and they'll think I'm another one of the addicts otherwise. <laughs> so yes. 
So, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, we, we ever, pretty much everybody's familiar with your story, but we'll go over a bit of it uh, overall as well. I mean, we, we, you, the last time you were with us, you mentioned there was a book coming, and uh, here it is. It's out. It's published. It's, it's been making a lot of waves. Uh, tell us a little bit. What's the basis of the book then? Is this a first-person narration? Is this giving the history of what happened? What, what is uh, within that book? Yeah, well, it's basically telling the story of uh, how I came to be involved and what my involvement was once we got to Ottawa and ever since, really. Um, I, I love it. I, I think it captures the story really nicely and it's a nice, easy read. And uh, I think it'll I think it'll answer a lot of people's questions. I, I've been very quiet for the last year, as you know, so I think this will give people an opportunity to uh, have some of their own questions answered also. Yeah, and you, you have been quiet, and for, for good reason on a lot of it, you've had to be. I mean, you've had to be very careful because of your status. For those who don't already know, you're technically, you're still on bail. Uh, you know, the, there's conditions attached to that. If those are violated, they already showed that there's some people be more than overjoyed to stick you back in holding if they could find an excuse. Uh, there's uh, clearly, I'm guessing, since you're still free and talking to me, unless you're in a hidden location, th th there's no problem then with publishing this book. It's not going to violate any of your, your bail conditions or anything like that. No. And, and we actually sent the draft to my criminal lawyer for him to re read and review and edit. And uh, actually, I was a little surprised, too. I wasn't sure what he was going to think, but he he sent his edits back and said, best of luck. <laughs> well, it's, it's good to be careful. I, I mean, you've already uh, done your, your, your share of time and remand. I'm sure you'd rather uh, not have to repeat any of that if, if you can help it. So uh, how far back does this book go uh, into the story then? I mean, is this more background on you or does it kind of begin when the, the convoy begins or uh, wh where does it start? It starts with a basically a brief background about my history and how I ended up becoming involved. But the bulk of the book is all about uh, the whole event, all the convoy, how I came to meet Chris and Bridget and, uh, you know, all the wonderful people that I've been so blessed to work with over the last year and a half. Um, because we've become like family, really, for most of us. And um, so it, it goes into a lot of the day-to-day -day, uh, things that were happening on the ground there in Ottawa and all the things that we were dealing with. I mean, it was it was chaos, it was a beautiful, beautiful chaos. Well, and, and I mean, you've, you've, well, yourself have become a polarized, polarizing figure because you've become something of a figure recognizable to do with the convoy, which of course was a polarizing event in itself. And I mean, Mizzle address a little of the misinformation. You're not allowed on social media, but I am. And I get out there and stir everybody up. But it's, of course, as soon as we announced you were coming on, we get the usual people jumping out. And I see the book gives you the opportunity to clarify a lot of things. And of course, one of the things that come, oh, here comes the grifter. She's looking to make more and more money out of this whole thing. And, and of course, the, the false allegation that you took money from the any of the fundraising or things such as that with the convoy and such, I imagine you can uh, clarify a lot of that within the book, right? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, there's, there's always going to be questions about the money. And if this convoy taught me anything, it is really that money is the root of all evil. Um, they, we've had a forensic audit done. Everything is accounted for all, all the donations that weren't able to be refunded to people is sitting in an escrow account we have a $406 million civil lawsuit that we're facing for nuisance. Uh, and then we have two, two orders general of, of Ontario. One was a forfeiture order and the second was a seizure order. So, I, I, you know, I don't even know if we'll ever see those donations. But obviously, if we do win all these cases, our objective is to make sure that that money gets used what it was donated for. And that is to we've got registration forms for some of the truckers. Um, another part of the group also did a poll on Facebook to find out what people wanted. And I mean, that's one of the things that I was always very mindful of is that we never looked at that as our money. I mean, that was Canadians money. So it was always important to have their input. And so they conducted a poll to find out, you know, what if people wanted any of those funds, should we ever have access to it to be used for legal representation uh, over and above uh, refunding, and it, we had an overwhelmingly positive response. So we'll see. There's there's lots to get before we even get close to that stage. So you're not coming to us from a mansion full of servants or anything like that, and uh, sleeping. No, I'm still waiting. I haven't got my Swiss bank accounts opened yet. I also heard I've got 
property in Mexico and a mansion in Hull, Quebec. And uh, it's just ridiculous. It, people need to find something better to do with their time. And honestly, it's a Google search. If people really want to know that badly, they could put in some effort and do some research. It's all out there in the public domain. Well, and, and you do have to watch what you search. Like if you search Corey Morgan worth, I've had people throw that at me. There's some goofy sites like Celeb Wiki and everything that say that I'm apparently worth between one and $5 million. And come on, you think I'd be wearing a cheap sport coat like this if that was the case? I mean, uh, the, the internet isn't always accurate. And that's where things like getting things straight uh, from the person himself with something like a book, at least you can cut through it and, and get your direct interpretation of what happened then. Yes, exactly. And I think it's really important to get the truth out. And I'm really happy, you know, we wanted to get try and get this book out a lot sooner, but I'm actually very happy with the timing. I mean, it's really interesting to see what's going to happen with this uh, peace act strike that's happening out east. Uh, see how they're handling that once they start blocking some infrastructure and, uh, you know, everything happens for a reason. I've always said that. And the timing of this book, I think, is is really good. There's a lot of truth coming out now. There's a lot of good things happening, uh, testimony and evidence coming out now again at the National Citizens Inquiry. So, yeah, I, I'm really happy with this and I, I hope everybody uh, appreciates it and, and, and enjoys it. Good. Yeah. And I mean, something that I, I imagine the book will go into, and I'm sorry, I apologize. Usually uh, when I get these, I've read the book already and I'm going to, I promise. Uh, I just wasn't able to get a copy in time to do so, but it, it'll give uh, like, some clarity too. Like a lot of people don't understand, you, you didn't anticipate what was going to happen like this was a, a snowball that just grew and, and sort of took you up within it I mean it started as a, a small initiative and and you know the, the world went went crazy but you weren't a professional activist you weren't anticipating or seeing a, a future or anything like what happened and, and I guess the book can show those steps on how you ended up where you did yes I, I think in the category of did not see this coming this is number one <laughs> for yeah. sure uh, so did, did you have some collaboration within the book then with some of the other people who were at the uh, protests with you or prior to it? Like, is it, is it all just your, yourself in, in the writing or are there some other? Uh, uh, oh, no, it. Yeah, it references, you know, Chris Barber, uh, Bridget, Ben, all, all the all the core team that was involved at the beginning. It, it references all of that, too. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's a whole story there. This is just that this is the story from my perspective and and what my experience was. Well, and that's, yeah, an important part to point out. I mean, you're not speaking for the entire convoy or even the everything that happened. You didn't see, you were just one person. I mean, certainly one pivotal person, but it was a very decentralized and unusual sort of a protest. I mean, you, you can't really lump it all into one area, but at least you can speak for the part that you were a part of. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Yep. I'm happy to say my piece very much so. And it is interesting when you see, yes, the, the, the Public Service Alliance of Canada. And uh, I know, uh, Nigel, our, our uh, opinion editor is working on that, or it might be out pretty soon with a column. Pointing out the parallels, though, that we've got people now that are hindering trade across ports of entry, that we're blocking things on Parliament Hill, that are keeping people from getting to their work. Uh, but I'm not hearing anybody talking about the Emergencies Act with them yet. No, I know. Isn't it ironic? Um it, it it really comes down to who's doing the protesting in this country, it seems, these days. Um, we were just a bunch of dirty blue-collar workers that were going to say our piece. And so I think we were looked upon in some circles uh, with disdain. And why are you here? And so it is interesting to see how these guys are getting treated. And uh, let's see if he opens up some dialogue with them and wants to talk to them and hear what they have to say. Well, yeah, and that's a, an excellent point. Like, and I'm not saying we want to get in there with the horses and start batoning the pro the the, the strikers or things like that. Two wrongs don't make a right. I mean, uh, if they are blocking people from getting to work, then perhaps we should work on making room so people can do so and things like that. But I mean, we, we don't want to see the Emergencies Act imposed against more people. We want to point out just that it was wrong then and it would be wrong now. But it's interesting how they have quite a double standard when it comes to what merits that sort of action. It certainly is. Yes. <laughs> I'm watching with great interest. Put it that way. Yes, it, I, I, absolutely. And uh, I, I hopefully, I mean, as you said, too, though, was that there will be dialogue. There's already dialogue. There's negotiators. I mean, even if they're not getting anywhere with the union, that, that was the, the biggest most insulting part of the whole convoy thing. There was never an effort to even make dialogue, even to show up, give you guys 20 minutes and then walk away and say, okay, they're all crazy, but we tried. Yes. 
Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I, I, I mean, a, a little bit of effort goes a long way, in my opinion, and, and in our case, for sure, for sure. So uh, what uh, what portion, I mean, uh, writing was new to you. I mean, you've always been vocal online and, and active with things like that. But I mean, uh, you know, I, I, I wrote a book recently as well. There were some parts I enjoyed writing more than others or I could really get into. I mean, uh, was was there a part of that engagement? I mean, you had a lot of time being sort of locked down even post-convoy, yeah. so that, that helped. Uh, but what, what, what do you really feel most satisfied with in that book? Oh, boy, that's a tough question. Um... I enjoyed it. I, I think it was really therapeutic for me because obviously this book was written before I went to testify at the national or at the POEC in Ottawa. So I found it very therapeutic for myself to get a lot of stuff out. Um, I think one of my favorite things about the book, honestly, is the relationships that we had that we forged, you know, since I mean, you're talking about a group of people that had never met before didn't know each other and just came together and had this beautiful, um, crazy experience, you know, uh, all with one common goal of trying to make our country a better place. And, and um, the whole thing, Corey, it's so hard to just pick something. I, I'm really pleased with it. I think there's a lot of good information in there. Um, I've, I've always been very a very open person and transparent, and I think it gives people an opportunity to get to know me better uh, also, So, which, which is important, and that's always been important to me from day one. <laughs> yeah, well, there's been a lot of efforts to really demonize and dehumanize a lot of the people taking part. And, and you know, that that's not unique to the left. There, there's conservatives who can be pretty, pretty nasty online as well and doing things like that. We can, can't forget that there's people behind those news stories and, and people behind these events that are going on and uh, giving the opportunity at least to speak up for themselves. You don't have to agree with them, but, you know, show a little respect, I guess. And, and uh, so true. That. I've seen people that wish I would wish, wish me dead. Uh, I've seen comments, you know, that they wish, w wish I would go back to jail or that w they want me to go to jail for the rest of my life. Like, I, I guess the thing is that they don't understand is that if that gets allowed to happen in this case, this government isn't going to be in power forever. So next time it could be them with a different government in power, you know. So uh, I, it's a really important case. I, I think me and Chris's criminal trial is going to be very important and, and set a precedent for what's going to happen for, for all Canadians going forward in cases like this. Yeah, and, and while I've got you, then, you know, before I let you go, so how are things going with your, your criminal trial? I mean, things just go so agonizingly slowly through our system. Is, is the timeline progressing at all with that? Well, we've been in and out of court hearings for the last month and a half, I guess. Nothing really was solved. Monday morning, we did get a decision from the trial judge that she is going to stay our trial judge, which is very good news for us because that means hopefully everything will stay on schedule. Chris and I are co-accused, and so we'll be facing trial together, and that is set to commence on September the 5th and uh, last for two weeks. Well, hopefully, I mean, we're hoping for a positive resolution, but I just imagine a resolution whatsoever is just, you know, hanging halfway between has got to be stressful. Yeah, you're right. Well, the, the, the punishment is in the process, right? Yes, absolutely. And they certainly used every bit of it that they could. So uh, before I let you go, where can people find a copy of that book for themselves? And are there any uh, events or things you'll be going to uh, to promote it? Uh, yeah, I, I think I'm coming to Calgary on May 6th for a book signing. I, I haven't quite confirmed it yet, but it sounds like it'll be May 6th at the Canyon Meadows uh, Cinemas. And then we'll be scheduling a tour here. Uh, I was gone yesterday, so I didn't have access to my emails, but I'll be checking that today. And we'll be starting a book tour right away and some book signings. Right now, you can find the book uh, at theconvoybook.com or right from Amazon also. So well, very excellent. excited. I hope everybody likes it. I hope you have to so. let me know what you think, Corey. I will. I will get it. I, I don't. Uh, I don't BS when I say I'm going to read a book. I, so I'm looking forward <laughs> to it. So thanks for writing that and uh, everything you've done, Tamara. And thanks for coming on again today. And uh, yeah, I'll send a note once I've uh, finished reading your book. There. Perfect. My pleasure. And thanks so much for having me. It's always good to see you. Great. Thanks, Tamara. Have a great day. Thanks.
So that was Tamara Leach. And yes, that new book, as you can see, it's quite easy to find. Just look it up, look up Tamara, hold the line. It's on Amazon and she'll be going around promoting it. It's good to get direct stories on what happened. I mean, especially something is, is hey, why is the convoy and thing? Let's get some clarity. And you might not agree with everything she's written. I mean, in fact, if you agreed with everything, there's probably something a little wrong with you. We've got different points of view. That's the problem we have these days. Nobody's respecting other points of views. So this is where you can clarify some stuff and get that out there. And I get annoyed with that. Oh, it's grifting. Well, you know what? You don't have to buy the book. That's it. That's, grifting is when the gun's to your head. And the ones who do that are the government. Not private enterprise. This is private enterprise. Don't buy the book if you don't like it then. But, uh, you know, I'm going to buy it. And uh, I'm certainly going to review it and, and, and talk about it. And hey, if it's terrible and everything else, I'll be real polite about it. But I'll still give an honest review. But I'm sure it'll be good. All right. So speaking of grifters, I want to expand a little more on that and uh, talk about the Public Service Alliance of Canada strike that's going on. And it's only been, what, uh, 10 days or so or, or, or whatnot. But this was quite striking, and it's on the Western Standard News as, as well now, pointing out it was the Globe and Mail that broke it, to give them credit. But apparently, these strikers are still going to be continuing to receive their regular salaries until May 10th. They're getting full pay. I mean, not that they were doing a hell of a lot before they went on strike. We know that. They're civil servants. But even since they've walked out, they're getting full pay. This is ridiculous. This is beyond the pale. I mean, if you're going to have your union, fine, that's a right. And if you're going to have your union dues go into that kitty for your strike pay, fine. And then the union can pay your butts while you waddle up and down the streets holding your campaign signs for four hours oh, a day. I mean, I know it was hard getting off the couches, guys. But to get paid while they're on strike, we are paying them not to work. I mean, we were already paying them not to work, but we're paying them not to work even more so now. This is ridiculous. Of course, this strike is going to drag out. It's not costing any one of those picketers a nickel. You see, part of the, the impasse, if you're going to have a strike, if workers are refusing to do their work and whoever they're striking against is not getting you know, their, their business or products done, eventually, hopefully, theoretically, you'll get to a point of you know, negotiation and, and settle things. But if one side is taking no punishment, taking no risk, taking no hit, it's not going to be settled. So these guys can sit for another two weeks of doing nothing and get full pay. So all the pressure is going on the government. All the pressure is going on the taxpayer. As we can't get our passports renewed, as goods are getting hindered, getting across the border right now, as people are getting blocked from federal services, immigration services falling behind. Uh, of course, CRA services, as much as we despise giving our money to the CRA, it's not going to get any easier for waiting. And as they bring in a backlog, again, it's not like those jerks were all that efficient in processing our taxes in the first place. But wow, but where, where on earth can you, you walk out on a job and you'll get paid full wages for the first apparently three weeks of your walkout? It's nuts. It's nuts. Speaking of nuts, let's talk about the federal government. Oh yeah, that was the federal government. Furthermore, so they're talking about their uh, firearms grab, of course, their, their, their legislation where they want to steal your property. They, they, they call it a buyback. Look, you can't buy back if it wasn't for sale. My property isn't for sale, so don't bother making an offer. And uh, forcing me to buy it back with the threat of the law against me, again, that's theft, even though you're compensating me for it. You know, you can't walk into somebody, hey, I like your car, I want to buy it off you. The person says, no, well, too damn bad, I'm going to beat the hell out of you unless you take my money and give me your car. I mean, that's sort of what we're talking about. So it's not a buyback, guys. It's a seizure, and they're giving a little bit of tax money to you for it. But they talked with this Canadian Sporting Arms and Ammunition Association to start their program to start uh, grabbing those firearms, grabbing that property from law-abiding citizens. Because these are law-abiding citizens. This is not taking criminal guns. That's what the whole basis and the infuriating part of this. We've got shootings going all over the place. And we've got the numbers. We've got the statistics. We know what's going on. They're smuggled, illegal firearms, often from the states. So what are they targeting? People who follow the law, people who registered their restricted firearms, people who bought them in good faith, people who committed no crimes. If they committed no crimes, guess what, guys? You're not going to prevent any crimes by stealing their property. In fact, you're committing another crime, and it's against the citizens. But they're moving towards that. Um, 
And they're starting in the east. If you remember, they were going to begin in Prince Edward Island. They want to start in one of the most areas with the fewer firearms, uh, at least. And again, this gets back to Alberta, Saskatchewan, the provinces. Uh, they've been telling, especially in the west, the government to go to hell. We're not going to help you with this. And uh, our, our recent thing I heard on the news in Alberta was in Alberta, nobody, no officer, whether it's RCMP or special firearms officers or whatever the government wants to create, is going to be allowed to seize property and firearms from Albertans without a permit from the province. Yeah, fighting bureaucracy with bureaucracy. So that'll be interesting. Come on and get them, guys. Good luck. Uh, uh, presumably, if we've got Premier Smith, Daniel Smith in the next month, they're going to demand a uh, permit from you guys to come steal our guns, and I doubt you're going to get it. Uh, meanwhile, firearms owners, I don't think a heck of a lot of them are going to just pop out there and give up their property to you guys. You know, and uh, Marco Mendicino, my favorite, he's the public safety minister, minister of lies. This guy, he has been caught lying more times. I mean, lying in politicians, you know, of course, it's, it's not all that uh, unusual. You know, as Forrest would say, they're going to go together like peas and carrots. But Mendicino brings it to a whole new art form. I think he's incapable of telling the truth. I mean, this guy is pathological. And yeah, this is the guy in charge of the firearm theft from, from law-abiding firearm owners. But also, you see, what they're trying to pack into their legislation is saying, we're going to crack down, though, on illegal firearm use. Most of us are okay with that. Okay, that's fine. The lunatic robbing places with a firearm? Yes, we want to see heavy sentences for them, the person assaulting people with it, the person shooting people with it. But they're talking about, so they want to increase the maximum for firearm crimes, for gun running and things like that, uh, to 14 years from 10 years. But when he was asked about how many people had ever actually gotten the maximum at 10 years, he talked in circles, says, by raising maximum sentences, we're sending a strong signal. He was asked again, well, how many people got the 10-year sentence? Wouldn't answer it. Because people didn't even get the last maximum. So it's not like you hit a wall of maximums that judges were trying to give these gun runners. They were already giving them limp-wristed, weak sentences. So increasing the maximum isn't going to make a bloody difference. They're not really cracking down on the illegal firearms. They're cracking down, as usual, on the law-abiding firearm owners. But, yeah, Minichino taking the questioning with his uh, smirk and his, uh, his lies. He's, he's a liar. I'll say that outright. There's lots of evidence on it by all means. You know, send the legal letters. We can find all sorts of incidents where he just outright makes stuff up. Uh, speaking of making stuff up, criminals. It looks like a, this was interesting. A, a Commons Public Accounts Committee... We don't want to forget about this one. All the rest of the stuff's going on in the world. But uh, they're, they're ordering hearings on the Trudeau Foundation. Like, what an ugly mess that's turning into, and people are forgetting about it. And that was a 10 to 0 vote to have the CRA. Of course, they're on strike, but we'll see whenever they get back. They're going to scrutinize the Trudeau Foundation. Like, that thing was started with $125 million tax dollars. They keep saying it's an arm's-length charity. Just because it says Trudeau doesn't mean it has something to do with Trudeau. Well, wait a minute. Justin Trudeau's brother is on the board with it, and he was cutting deals for donations from Chinese Communist Party. That's kind of a Trudeau involvement in it. Justin Trudeau's half-sister is on the board and involved with the Trudeau Foundation. And you know, it's a charity. So what? The WE charity was there too. And how was that used? Oh yeah, hundreds of thousands of dollars in speaking fees going to Margaret Trudeau or to Alexander Trudeau. Look, they're using these things to launder bloody tax dollars into their pockets. Come on. So is it happening in the Trudeau Foundation? I don't know, but it stinks. It stinks to high heaven. And why? Why if this supposed foundation has no connection with Justin Trudeau and it won't win his influence by donating to it, then why were the Chinese Communist Party so eager to keep pouring money into it? I mean, I'm sorry, guys. The Chinese Communist Party looks out for the Chinese Communist Party. They aren't the philanthropists who care about the goodwill for Canadians. The other thing with that foundation is it had charitable status. And to maintain charitable status, you have to put out, I believe it's something like 3.8 or 4% of your, your assets into the actual charity every year. It means you actually have to not just take money in, but spend it out on the charity you say you were holding. If you were the head of the Special Olympics and you took in a million dollars in donations... You would have to spend at least, and that's not much anyways, $40,000 on holding a sporting event or something to do with the Special Olympics. The Trudeau Foundation didn't even reach that bar three out of four years. Shouldn't they be deregistered as a charity? I bet you if you had a small charity, they'd do it. 
Uh, this country is corrupted on so many levels, so many levels. It's not serving any of us well. Speaking of serving people poorly, here's another one we're hearing about, of course. The horror is in Sudan. It's going bad over there. And people are trying to escape. They're trying to get out. It's, it's awful. And yet again, this looks just like Canada in Afghanistan. When we knew it was coming, we had the warnings, we had the rumblings. We have Canadian citizens and permanent residents over in the, the area that's breaking out in war. And we aren't evacuating. And we abandoned them. We left them. You know, the ambassador is always hightailing it out pretty darn fast in a luxury jet. But the people on the ground are screwed. And in Sudan, that's what's happening right now. So, uh, yeah, the big news, an additional 50 were evacuated out the other day. 50. You know, how is it that Calgary can ship 2,000 of people uh, a day down to Mexico for, for vacations from the airport, but it's impossible to get more than 50 people a day out of Sudan? Is it that hard to get a, a jet out there? And, in fact, it turns out most of those... Uh, got out from the planes and boats of other countries. Canada didn't even help them, the Canadians. Yeah, embarrassing. We, can't, we don't have the hardware. We don't have the military ability to save the Canadians or permanent residents who were there. There's 1,800 Canadian citizens over there. And 700 of them have said, please help me get out of here. And we can't because we are a country that's too inept and full of vain navel-gazing with a prime minister in love with himself and forgetting his actual duties to citizens overseas. And now they're stranded over there. And let's hope there's not more tragedy. In Afghanistan with our allies, the people who helped us out out there, we abandoned them, we left them. Again, the ambassador got out fast enough, but uh, they were left to the warlords and, and, and terrible uh, uh, Taliban punishments they were going to get for having cooperated with Canada. What an embarrassment as a nation. You know, we used to be such a, a proud nation in a lot of ways, and look what we're down to now. And again, let's get to resources. Let's talk about subsidies. Here's one of the things people have been turning around. Oh, look, you're getting mad about the Volkswagen subsidy, but think about the, the billions that Trudeau put in the Trans Mountain Pipeline. Well, there's a difference there. There's a big difference there. The Trans Mountain Pipeline, nobody asked them to buy it. All we needed them to do was get out of the way. They kept moving the regulatory goalposts, kept adding more and more crap onto Kinder Morgan, who were trying to build it, who were going to build it for like four, what, four and a half billion dollars, I believe it was, of private dollars, wouldn't have cost us a nickel, just had to get out of the way. Not even a new pipeline. It's just putting one right next to one that's existed for the last 60 years without problems. But Kinder Morgan finally said, that's enough, we're, that, we're out of here, this is nuts. And the government bought it because he realized he blew it. And it's ballooned up to 30 billion now. 30 billion. And it's not done. Way behind schedule. Way behind schedule. Well, now I find out work has been halted on it yet again. Yes, there was an injury somewhere on the pipeline out there. I think out by Chilliwack. So they shut the whole thing down. Because again, you see, when you get a government-run project, and the oil field's been getting bad even in the private area for that. But the HSE guys, the safety maggots, they shut everything down over the dumbest of things. I mean, shut down a little zone, do a safety stand on, fine. But when you're shutting down a pipeline worth that much, we're talking millions and millions of dollars, it's not making them any less injured or dead. we got to get that damn thing done. And we're regulating it to death as we're trying to build it. There was a hummingbird nest. And I mean, somebody referred to it as the $100 million hummingbird nest. Because that was found a couple seasons ago on the side. And it wasn't an endangered hummingbird. It wasn't a rare hummingbird. But they found it in the environment. we got to stop a big giant section of the construction of the pipeline because we don't want to disturb that hummingbird nest. And we got to study this now. In the end, it cost like $100 million to save a nest. Not even the hummingbird itself. Just the nest. You know what? If you cut the nest down, the bird will probably fly 10 more feet in the trees and make a new one. No wonder the damn pipe's not getting done. But I don't think they want to get it done. How's Trudeau going to plug his hydrogen dreams and his battery factories if we're actually supplying petrochemical products to the world like we should? And gas, LNG, getting back to that. we got the terrorists on the CGL line that's supposed to feed the LNG port up in uh, the West Coast. Guess what? The United States has got LNG. They're the top exporter in the world with it now. You know, UAE, all sorts of countries. Not us. Not us. We're shutting it in. Instead, we're spending billions of our own dollars to build batteries from a foreign company out here in Canada. Brilliant. Brilliant, guys. All right. Leave off on one final note with my ranting. Watch out. God, it sounds like it's going crazy. I went many years ago to it down in Cancun, Mexico. Fantastic, beautiful area. Caribbean clear waters. But man, looks like they got a hell of a drug war going on down there. We're hearing more and more of it. I don't like to knock Mexico. I love Mexico. I love Mexicans. But geez, they just found a, another eight bodies dumped close to Cancun. Yeah, they've been missing for some time. And uh, they found them down there. I'm just saying, if you're considering... Uh, 
vacations, guys. It's a popular destination for Canadians, but you might want to steer clear of Cancun for the next little while. They, they've really got some stuff they're settling out there. All right. Well, that's about it for the show today, guys. We covered a lot of ground, had a good guest, and uh, well, I ranted right out. So, uh, you know, watch for the pipeline that'll be coming on a little later this evening, guys. That's our panel show with a bunch of us. Be sure to take a subscription out with the Western Standard. It's how we take the bills. WesternStandard.news slash membership. Ten bucks a month. Full unfettered access to all of our news and opinion content. Thank you all for tuning in this week. I'm going to have another great guest and a whole bunch more stuff to rant about next week at this time, and I'll see you then. Canadian Shooting Sports Association. Without the CSSA, our gun rights would have been taken long, long ago. These guys are on the front lines helping to draft smart and intelligent firearms regulations and legislation in Canada. And more importantly, educating the public about how we keep guns out of the hands of the wrong people. To become a member, it's absolutely worth every penny. Folks, it's springtime and the Leafs are in the playoffs. Even the markets are surprised. I was going to wear a Flames jersey to represent all the red we've been seeing in the market, but I thought that might be too soon for some of you Flames fans out there. So... I think we better just get into these prices just to keep everything everybody happy here. Cash barley is unchanged at 419. Feed wheat we're sitting up three dollars to 418 a metric, and corn we're up five dollars to 412 per metric. Moving to the milling wheat markets, so July Minneapolis futures dropped 14 and a half cents to 822 per bushel, with local hard red spring bid for May movement at 10 dollars per bushel delivered. In the oil seeds, nearby canola futures went up $10.80 to seven thirty seven twenty per ton, with delivered values for May movement at seventeen forty per bushel. Continuing on to the pulse markets, nearby red lentil prices are trading at thirty four cents a pound, and yellow peas remain at twelve dollars per bushel. Finishing up with the cattle markets, June live cattle slid zero point four cents to one sixty three sixty three per hundredweight. For more information on pricing, or if you just want to talk about how great those Leafs fans are, give me a call. I'm Mike Van Dyke at Marketplace Commodities, accurate real-time marketing information and pricing options.